And my sense is, is that why we're in a shock is, is that we had no very good way of getting back to where we needed to be from a supply standpoint before the invasion of Ukraine. And now with 5 million barrels of Russian export off the market, and again, there are no sanctions yet, it's just nobody wants to touch the stuff, um, we're down, you know, we're down five or six percent of, uh, of world supply, and that's the biggest um, oil crisis shock since the Iran-Iraq war in, in, two, in 1980. So what's happening right now is, is, is a really big deal, and it's not a big deal just for people in the oil and gas business. It is, it is I believe, uh, going to fundamentally restructure uh, the economy. Um, and probably the world order as we know it. So uh, buckle up. It's, it's going to be a wild ride. Hi, folks, and welcome to Wealthion. According to today's guest, energy expert and petroleum geologist Art Berman, the world is now experiencing an oil shock, the magnitude of which we've rarely seen before. Oil prices had risen tremendously over the past two years off of their 2020 lows, but the recent outbreak of war in Ukraine has propelled them into a higher orbit. The trade embargo is currently under consideration against Russia in response to the invasion, sent oil prices briefly up to $137 on Sunday night. That's nearly twice the price that oil traded at at the start of this year, just two months ago. And it's not just oil. The price for natural gas in Europe has increased fivefold since 2020. How much worse is the situation likely to get? And what economic repercussions will these runaway energy prices cause? Art, thanks so much for making yourself available on such short notice to keep us on top of this fast unfolding situation. Well, thanks for inviting me, Adam. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thanks, Art. I got to imagine you might be a little bleary eyed after last night's actions in the futures market. And um, I'm sure you're getting hit with a lot of questions from your regular constituency. So thank you for taking the time to talk to us here. And let's dive right in. Um, sure. You've just released a, a piece called Oil Shock. I'm going to go through that uh, here with you largely uh, in this discussion because it's chock full of a lot of insights and charts that I think try to you know, really make it helpful in understanding what's going on here. And as I mentioned, this is a very fluid situation. Um, right. So this kind of data really helps. But Art, maybe we could just start for a second with the causes of this because it's sort of multifactorial. We, we, we had rising oil prices, as I mentioned, kind of all through 2021. Uh, but now we have this new development um, with Russian supplies at least being seriously constrained, it looks like, going forward. Why is oil shooting up as high as it is right now? Oil is as high as it is, as I titled my, my post, because we're in an oil shock. And we're having an oil, we, we were having a, uh, an oil shock of sorts before Russia invaded Ukraine, and the simple reason for that was that basically OPEC and their friends and neighbors, OPEC Plus, have mismanaged supply. And I don't mean that uh, to be critical of, of OPEC or OPEC Plus. It's just a fact. And so as uh, some of your, your viewers and subscribers will know, OPEC and their friends withheld about 10 million barrels per day of of crude oil and condensate from world markets back in uh, March, April of 2020 because demand was way down and that was a way of kind of getting things back together. And they did a great job. Um, they did a great job of, of uh, easing us back into more supply until a couple of months ago. And then uh, they seemed to lose the thread and the world was saying, hey guys, uh, you know, we just kind of need you to go back to where you were before because supplies are getting tight. And OPEC was um, insistent that they had it all under control. And, and by the time they got the message that they really needed to increase uh, production, it turned out that an awful lot of their members just didn't have the capacity to do it anymore, that they had had a lot of economic problems, they hadn't invested in infrastructure, they hadn't invested in new production. So a lot of countries, uh, you know, notably 
uh, Nigeria, um, uh, and some of the North African countries, just they just didn't have the capacity to bring on. And so since then, OPEC has been sort of, you know, hiding this problem by saying, well, you know, we think we got it under control. But bottom line, you withhold a lot of oil, you don't return it, you don't uh, return it in a timely way. It's like the Federal Reserve. I mean, if they, you know, if they if they increase interest rates too quickly, um, you end up in a recession. And and so OPEC did that. But there's another factor going on, and that is that investors have been telling the oil and gas companies they don't want to see this growth anymore. They want returns. And so they there has been a lot of capital withheld from oil and gas companies doing more drilling and investors are have been enamored with uh, you know the so-called ESG, the environmental social governance and uh, you know green energy and you know and again all all good. Um, I'm not making any value judgments, but that's what happened and and so now even with an oil shock there's a lot of ceos that are saying nah, you know we're 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 not we're not going to do much about it because we're making lots of free cash flow investors are coming back they're happy with us and why would we blow a good thing so you combine it all together and then you add covid into it and we had a lot of uh you know, supply chain issues and a lot of changes in the patterns of world uh, supply and demand, not just of oil and gas, but of everything. Uh, you know, I mean, look at the way that we we work these days. I mean, how many people actually go into an office, uh, uh, use a lot less gasoline, commercial real estate is, is way down. Uh, you know, different. So, so the world is a different place than it was in 2020, and we haven't adjusted very well. And my sense is, is that why we're in a shock is, is that we had no very good way of getting back to where we needed to be from a supply standpoint before the invasion of Ukraine. And now with 5 million barrels of Russian export off the market, and again, there are no sanctions yet, it's just nobody wants to touch the stuff, um, we're down, you know, we're down five or six percent of, uh, of world supply. And that's the biggest um, oil crisis shock since the Iran-Iraq war in, in, two, in 1980. So what's happening right now is, is, is a really big deal. And it's not a big deal just for people in the oil and gas business. It is, it is I believe, uh, going to fundamentally restructure uh, the economy. Um, and probably the world order as we know it. So uh, buckle up. It's, it's going to be a wild ride. Oh, um, all right. So great explanation. Um, biggest uh, oil supply crisis since the Iranian oil crisis back in the early 80s. And a lot of people watching remember those days. So um, when we last talked Art, and I know it's a different world since we last talked just a couple months ago, but you know, I recall you saying at the time, and correct me if I'm wrong, I recall you saying at the time that you thought that oil prices may moderate a bit from, from when we were talking, but you thought they'd have sort of a new higher floor, which was going to be somewhere sort of between 70 and 80, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, has this now just changed that game? Um, oh, I think sure. I see I see in your piece here, it sounds like you're seeing that there's plenty of room that you think prices could go higher for longer here than most people are currently expecting. Is that is that indeed the case? That 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 is the case. And so what I was talking about whenever that was, we we chatted last Adam was that looking at supply demand data and forecasts, um, we still believe that there will be some moderation in the supply demand deficit in the first couple of quarters of 2022. And that's because, I mean, it, it's real straightforward. You increase price and people get after it. They want to make money. And so new supply has been anticipated by everyone when we talked last and, and, and since, and it's, it's still happening. It's just, it was never going to be enough and all those forecasts indicated that by the end of 2022, we'd be back into a serious supply demand deficit again. But now we have this additional problem of subtracting 5 million barrels a day of, of, of Russian export. And, and again, just to 
make sure everybody understands. I mean, Russia is the second biggest oil producer in the world. I mean, second only to the United States. Russia produced something like 10 and a half, 10.6 million barrels of crude oil and condensate in January. So, I mean, this, this is not some, I mean, we, we talk a lot from time to time, oh, well, you know, Libya's down 500,000 barrels a day, or Venezuela's down, you know, three quarters of a million. And, you know, those are big deals too, but we're talking about the, the second biggest oil producer in the world. I mean, this is really, I mean, this, this is a whole different league uh, and, and, you know, in no way to diminish the significance of, you know, the importance of Libya or any of those other countries. But, you know, we're talking about a whole different level of, uh, of shortage here. So, so my, my sense back then, and, and, and to some extent, you know, let me be clear, um, higher oil prices, whether they were $80, $90, $120, will have a profound effect on demand. We call it demand destruction. And will and are having a profound effect on the level of global economic activity. And so in my post, there's a, a sentence that I, I didn't hide in there. I slipped it in there in which I say that both oil demand destruction and economic recession are possible at current oil prices and probable at higher oil prices. I mean, that's the way the market works. And so if, if, if a, a gallon of gasoline increases by a dollar, say, uh, there's an awful lot of people who will choose to drive less because they can. They, they want to save money. It's discretionary. And, and as, as you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's two year old or so data now from the, the Fed, but I think it was in 2019, you know, something like half of Americans don't have more than $400 of spare cash. And so if you can save a buck on every gallon of gasoline, there's, there's certainly a number of Americans that will choose to drive less. And that's what demand destruction is about. There's a certain amount of consumption of whatever we're talking about, electricity, oil, that, that is pretty much inelastic, um, but there is, a, there is a, a percent that's quite elastic and we're gonna see diminishing use in that area. But the, the more important or maybe equally important is, I mean, all, all the inflation that's gone on here in the last six months or so, and we have economists and they, you know, they got all sorts of great economist kind of stuff that they throw at it, you know, it's production, it's wages, it's interest rates, it's, you know, you name it. But, but really, it's about energy costs. I mean, and, and economists are, they, they don't seem to pay very much attention to natural resources in general, because it doesn't fit, they can't write an equation for it. But, and I'm, and I'm not trying to be, you know, critical of economists, it's just a fact. And, and if you look at, and I've got, a, I've got a chart in my post of oil price versus um, U.S. inflation rates, I mean, you know, the, the correlation, is, you just can't dismiss it. I mean, it's right there. And it makes sense because everybody to run a business uses energy. I mean, we use energy to manufacture things, transport things, market things, uh, keep the heat on, pay our employees. And so if, 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 this fundamental underlying cost has increased 20, 30, 40 percent in a year or so. Well, your cost of business has increased. And how do you how do you you pass it on? Right. So everything gets more expensive. And as things get more expensive, then people want higher wages. And, and you know, the you know, the whole story better than I do. And so inflation is is getting out of control. and um, and we are going to see demand destruction. We're already seeing. I mean, the, 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 the uh, Atlanta Fed just, uh, there's a chart in, in my post on that. Their, you know, their evolution of thinking is what they call it. It's kind of a forecast. Their forecast for the first quarter of 2022 for the U.S. GDP is 0% growth. And, you know, that's, that, that, that's not too sweet. <laughs> It's not, and I, and I just want to contrast it that it was six and a half percent the previous quarter. Yeah, <laughs> that is a massive deceleration. 
thank you. And 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 it's still uh, the, the consensus view, you know, is still a couple of percent higher. So we we don't know what's hap- what's going to happen there. I mean, it is a forecast, and hopefully they're a little bit wrong. But but my point is is that the global economy is slowing down, and and a big reason for that is energy costs. And with what's happened in recent days in Ukraine, that's going to get worse a long time before it gets better. And frankly, I don't see a way for it to get better except an economic response. I mean, we just don't have the supply to make it better. And, you, you know, you listen to a lot of uh, what I call, uh, you know, energy morons um, that, that make up our, 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 our political class. You know, they're... And you got guys talking about, well, you know, we're going to increase our production. And I mean, even Elon Musk says we're going to, well, what does Elon Musk know about oil and gas? But but the point is, that sounds really good, guys, but this is my business. And I don't see where it's going to come from. I just don't see where it's going to come from. So so the idea that we need to get busy and start drilling, well, okay, fine. I mean, that that's what markets are telling us. That's what a hundred and you know, and thirty-seven dollars overnight on Brent meant. I mean, that's the market saying, "Come on, guys, get busy." But the market isn't as, as moronic as some of the people that get on on the news. The market knows it's going to take a year at least before that price actually gets any oil on the market. And maybe politicians know that, and maybe they just they just don't care. But so so I don't see a way out of this. Is is, is what I'm saying except that higher prices will cause a reaction and 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 that reaction is not good economically all right uh, a lot of great territory and very important territory you just covered there um i'm just trying to figure out how i want to uh, i want to follow up on it with you uh to keep the thread here uh let me, let me start back on the supply side for a second. So um, it sounds like you said, you know, pre-Ukrainian invasion, um, we had supply tightness in the oil uh, industry anyways, because multifactorial, but because there were a lot of countries that were basically sort of, a lot of countries and companies that were under-investing uh, in, in their infrastructure, right? right? So you had, uh, you had uh, some of the OPEC nations, um, as you said, I sort of sort of mismanaged things. Maybe they were getting a little bit greedy and, and, and happy to have these higher oil prices and just wanted to collect profits for a while. You said the same thing with the oil major companies that their investors had been pushing them for returns. Uh, so, hey, guys, don't spend so much on exploration. Uh, just kind of milk the cow as much as you can right now. Um, we've had other past guests on this program, Rick Rule being one of them. Um, who have talked a lot about uh, the CapEx drought that we've been in for a number of key commodities, but certainly oil being one of them. Um, and I think a really important point to hammer home, which you've already done a good job here, is you can't just turn oil supplies on and off like a switch, right? Once you've shut wells down, um, once you've, you know, the crews have disbanded, um, it takes a long time to bring production back online. Uh, and it certainly takes a lot more time to go out and find new oil deposits and then bring them up to production ready status once you've actually found them. And there's a whole bunch of risk in that process as well. So while economists might think higher prices solve everything because, oh, if the price goes up, enough supply will eventually come online to meet it, um, it doesn't happen quickly. <laughs> uh, and so we've got this potentially really long lag, as you were saying, if prices remain at these elevated levels for that supply that we're gonna to need to come back online to begin to moderate prices just using supply alone, right? And as you said, you don't, you don't even see how we're gonna get there, at least not in the next year or two, right? And I see you sort of nodding mostly as I'm saying this. Um, so uh, it sounds like the, the only way in which this is gonna moderate at least over the course of the year in your, your eyes is um, demand's just gonna to have to drop. And uh, that means less, economic activity is going to happen. And that's why you're banging the drum here about the potential for recession. And I could agree with you, Art. It, it's hard to see that uh, anything else in that short of a time frame from happening here. And as you rightly say, I'm going to put up a chart that you, you put in your post here as well. We call oil the master resource because it's used in basically bringing every other resource to market. Right. So there's an embedded energy cost in almost every other commodity that's out there. And we're seeing commodity prices across the board continue to rise pretty dramatically here. I mean, this chart has uh, 
uh, just over this past week, uh, we've seen gains in key commodities from anywhere from 5% to 40%. And there are a few of them like wheat, which you know uh, Ukraine and, and Russia are big producers of that are the most extreme cases there. But a number of these things, they just they just require you know oil to get extracted out of the ground and and, and that's getting reflected in the pricing here so um, you know I think the big threat is I think you're doing a really good job of, of emphasizing here is that we should really be girding for a big economic slowdown and if GDP is already at Q1 of 2022 uh, here looking like it's going to be zero it's pretty hard not to see that we're not going to have contraction going on for the rest of this year and there's all sorts of knock effects knock-on effects that that happen you know from there people begin to get their hours cut or maybe you know companies start to downsize um obviously high input costs bring down profit margins at companies which means that uh profits are less stock prices have to come down maybe companies need to start laying off as a result maybe companies start going bankrupt um so there's a whole danger of these kind of economic cascading effects here where you know we kind of dragged a bunch of people out of the the employment that the COVID shutdown sent them into. Is there a potential that we may be going back into days like that, where all of a sudden we, we, we start seeing the unemployment rolls start rising and things like that because the, the country just can afford to do less? I fear that, yes, but it's going to be uneven. Uh, obviously, the, the sectors that have to do with energy are, are going to have um, more more capital than they probably will know how to how to use intelligently. Uh, other sectors are are, are going to be hurting. But let let me make it clear, Adam, and and I know you know this. We're talking about a business as usual world. This all assumes that things don't get worse as far as the war in in, in Ukraine is going. And and I think I you know I don't want to I don't want to get out of my lane here, but um, what is happening as I understand it right now is that um, th there's a very good chance that that the kinds of, of financial sanctions I'm talking about economic sanctions things like you know freezing the Russian central bank's assets the financial sanctions could very well ruin the Russian economy. And that makes for a desperate leadership of that country. And that's assuming that everything goes exactly how they want it to in Ukraine, which isn't, I'm, I'm very skeptical of the news reporting, not because I'm a conspiracy guy, but um, you know, I, I, think, I think realistically, um, Ukraine has got a TV star running the country and he's good, he's really good. And I think Ukraine is 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 world class at its um, manipulation of social media and use of of iPhone videos. I mean, they're just doing a spectacular job, uh, better than Russia. But that doesn't mean that we're we're seeing the truth. Uh, I don't know what the truth is, and I'm not I'm not doubting. There's a lot of problems going on over there. But but where we're going is, I mean, I think the. The, the possibility of some sort of nuclear weapons being used, maybe not in Ukraine, over the next several months is higher than it's been since I was a kid, and, you know, back in the early 60s with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I don't just say that, to, you know, to, to create a buzz. I mean, I, I, I honestly believe that. Um, I mean, a, Rus a, a desperate Russia and a desperate Putin, who knows what they will do? I mean, I don't know what they will do. And, and on the other side, the kinds of measures that the United States and its allies have taken against Russia and Putin are extraordinary by any, by any standards. I, I don't know of, of this kind of so-called sanctions that have ever been employed before. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not judging. I'm not saying they're right or they're wrong or anything like that. I'm just saying that it ups the stakes hugely. And, and so we, we look back, look at what happened to the, the, the world order in the Middle East when George W. Bush and his buddies decided that we should invade Iraq. And again, not, not arguing whether that was the right or the wrong thing to do, but it created a power vacuum. And 
one of the very clear beneficiaries was Iran. I mean, that that just tremendously increased Iran's power and influence in that area. Clearly, that was an unintended consequence. Nobody wanted that, but that's what happened. And so if by taking down Russia, which is, I don't know how else to put it, um, that's going to create a much larger kind of instability or distortion in the world order. And I can't imagine where that goes. And, and maybe that's a good thing since that's not my expertise. But, but my point is, is that we're seeing a simultaneous structural change of decadal proportions in energy markets and potentially in world power. And all of that coming on the heels of two years of COVID being the biggest economic disruption, certainly in our lifetimes. And you know, you, you mix all that together and and the you know the potential outcomes are just absolutely unimaginable, unthinkable. Who knows what's gonna happen? Some of it may be good, um, but the point is is that the level of uncertainty going forward is 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 almost un unthinkable. Wow. Well, uh, very good point. Um, you know, we're level of uncertainty is sort of off the charts at this point, right? And you're saying that that literally that's it may be unimaginable. There, there, we, we might not even be able to really have any concept of predicting what could come out of this uh, because the, the spectrum of potential opportunities is so wide at this point. Uh, and, and I agree. And, and you know, if if this goes as as badly as I would say your darkest fears think it could, Art, then yeah, I mean, we, we nothing we talk about in today's podcast is really going to matter because we're going to be living in a world that is just radically different. Um, so let me ask you this then. So uh, let's assume for a moment that. Um, things resolve more speedily on, on the, the uh, Ukraine side of things. So let's say that they agree to a ceasefire. Let's say that um, the world starts working to, okay, how, 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 as the dust is settling here, how do we want to operate going forward? Um, so let, let's talk about sort of maybe best case scenario first. Um, What's interesting about the current sanctions, which you said have not even been implemented yet, it's really sort of um, more, more boycotts that are going on right now where countries are just refusing or embargoes are just refusing to, to trade. Um, uh, you know, the sanctions as they're being penciled out right now, most countries are still basically saying, well, let's carve oil and gas out of that, right? And, and there was, uh, Germany just came out this morning um, basically saying, yeah, we, we need to carve economic, uh, we need to carve energy and oil out because we like it or not, we, we, we need it. We're, we're, we, we can't see ourselves uh, immediately weaning ourselves off of this. So I guess one question for you is, is can the world, the way that it's really currently operating, um, can it place a full embargo on, on Russian oil or, or is it going to have to find ways to live with Russia and what it's done, and yet still buy gas and oil from it for the foreseeable future, because it just is that dependent on it to operate. Um, again, business as usual world, best of all possible outcomes. Somehow the situation resolves. Frankly, I, don't, I, I can't see that, but um, let, let's just play that, that scenario out and say, all right, it, it happens. Um, I think the best case scenario for oil is that we find a way to meet our consumption needs for the next couple of quarters and then we're screwed. So, <laughs> so I mean, that, that, that's basically where we were before, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Right. And just to be clear, and we're screwed because um, of the sort of... Um, Secular supply, you know, the, the lack of investment in 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 future supply that we were talking about before all this Ukraine stuff happened, right? Yeah, and 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 the there is a uh, a popular misconception that there's sort of an infinite amount of oil that can be found and produced and 
relatively short order if we just have the wherewithal and the will to do it. And as someone who's, you know, spent more than four decades of, of his career in this business, show me where that is. Okay. I mean, where are all of these, where, or where, where are all of these spare reserves that we have? And so um, in my, in my post, I, I have a link to a, a very good short interview with uh, Damian Corvalin, who was the, uh, the head of energy research for Goldman Sachs. And whatever you think about Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, I think they do good work. The way they spin it is another story sometimes. But, but Damian goes through and he says, look, you know, the only real spare capacity, which is to say what could be reasonably brought to the market within 90 days. That's what spare capacity means. There's about two and a half million barrels, or maybe one and a half, uh, um, if you're looking at, I think it's one and a half million barrels that could be brought online in the next few months from Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, all right? And, and the rest, there, there's a, you know, maybe a half a million that could be available from Iran if somehow we're able to make a, a new nuclear deal with them by the end of the year. Um, and there's some more that they could bring on later, but you know, so now we got two million, and maybe there's a half a million that could come from uh, U.S. shale if we, you know, really got things going in a kick-ass kind of way there. And and so if you add it all up, maybe you meet your consumption needs for the first couple of quarters of the year. And beyond that, we don't know. We don't know where it's going to come from. I mean, I can tell you, I'm not going to bore you with it, but I mean, we sort of know what the proved reserves of the world are. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't surprises, but, you know, we kind of know that. And, and high oil prices mean that more reserves flat rather than less because it's a volume and a price. But, but there's not like this infinite amount. I mean, so much of, of the resources that are out there are in funky places and they're really deep and they're really hard to get to and they have all sorts of risk. We're talking, I mean, that, you know, we, we had this problem before shale that we were finding big fields, but it took a decade to bring them on after they were discovered. And so the world got on a production plateau. And so from 2005 to 2010, we just couldn't raise that plateau. That's what got oil prices up to $170 in 2022 dollars in 2008. So, and, so and, and then, sorry, just to build on that though, but then we had sort of the U.S. shale revolution, right. right? Which which brought a lot of new supply online, which was great and made a lot of people think, hey, we don't have to worry about this anymore because we right. have this quote unquote new technology of, of fracking, which of course have been around for a long time. Um, and uh, and what you've long said is, hey, that that bounty that we got from the U.S. shale miracle or revolution that folks used to you know call it um is is very time bound there's only so much there that can be pulled out that quickly and profitably and it begins to get a lot harder after that and, and i don't want to put words in your mouth but it sounds like you're saying the easy stuff's largely gone at this point on the shale story well not exactly okay clarify um, then yeah so i mean we 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 produce the very easiest stuff. And by the way, you know, this whole notion of U.S. energy independence. I mean, we exported like 90 percent of all that, that oil we produce from shale. So if it's so great, uh, you know, why do we get rid of it all? Why do we sell? I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying we shouldn't. I mean, we're in business to make money. And if that's how you make money, well, good for you. But um, it's not exactly something that was used a lot by Americans. Right. And sorry, sorry to interrupt too, but just we were importing millions of barrels a day as well at the same time. Right. And we don't we still are. Yeah. And we don't we don't need to go into complexities of exactly how it all works. But there's there's different um, di types of crude oil, basically. Um, and we export one type and we import a lot of another type. Correct. Exactly. And, and, and the reality is, is that nobody except refiners. <laughs> actually buy crude oil. I mean, you and I buy gasoline and propane and, you know, refined products. And so it turns out that the United States is the biggest producer of refined products in the world, you know, gasoline, diesel, you know, all that kind of good stuff. And so we import a lot of other people's oil 
so we can refine it and turn around and sell the world the products that come from it. All right. And so when, when people say, see the United States as a net exporter, well, we're a net exporter of what? We're a net exporter of refined products that we use other people's oil to make. And so this is, uh, you know, gets back to a, I, I can never find the reference, but somebody back in 2008 or nine said, well, you know, if, if, if a country produces no, no automobiles, imports a couple of million of them a day from some other country, paints them green, and then exports them back to the country it bought it from, are we an exporter of, of automobiles? And the answer, no, we're an exporter of green paint. And, and, and that's kind of the way that, that the U.S. works in, in terms of its petroleum products. And the people who say that we're energy independent, they're, they're talking about all those products. And I don't want to split hairs and get into it, but I just want everybody to understand that the United States is importing 6 million barrels of oil, crude oil a day today. And that's the lowest it's been for a long time. And that's more than anybody in the world except for China. So the notion that we are not an energy consuming country is just nonsense. It's complete. It's pure propaganda. OK. All right. So what you've been talking about here, Art, um, is largely you know, what has been called peak oil for many, many decades. Um, maybe a good qualifier on it is peak cheap oil. Um, yeah, there's still a lot of oil in the ground in certain places around the world. But as you're saying, it's, it's hard to get to, hard to extract. Uh, poor quality. Ener poor quality. Uh, energetically, and that's the key thing, it's, it's more expensive to extract and, and to take it to the extreme. Right. When you're expending a barrel's worth of energy to draw a barrel's worth of oil out of the ground, uh, that doesn't make any sense energetically going forward. Um, and so we're not at that stage yet with a lot of those plays, but, but we're, that's the direction we're heading into over time, right? We're so, heading in that direction. There's still plenty of oil, certainly in the Permian Basin, and that's what I was going to say before. I mean, there's, there's something like 25 billion barrels of proved crude oil and condensate reserves in the U.S. shale plays as of the end of 2020. And that was at a price of, you know, like $35 a barrel. So now 25 billion or 20 billion, it's a big number, but I mean, the US uses 5 billion a year. So it's, you know, if you wanna just make it real simple, it's, it's a five year buffer. And, and, and back to the miracle of, of shale, it basically bought us 10 years. It bought the world 10 years. And that's a really good thing, but it's, you know, it, it, it hasn't solved the problem it bought us some time and 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 we're now on the the, the descending part of that slope we're, we're we're not at the bottom but we're on the downward side and we don't know where we're going to go in the future and, and and that is the that is the dilemma that the world faces right now and and it's just that simple so peak oil i mean i'm glad you mentioned the i mean the 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 seminal article on peak oil was called The End of Cheap Oil, at least my seminal article. Hmm. And that was written by Campbell and La Herrera. And, you know, anybody who wants to can download a PDF of it. I mean, for free. You know, just look online. It was published, I think, in Scientific American. It's free. And that was the point that, that, that Ian and Jean made was, we're not talking about the end of oil. We're talking about the end of cheap oil. And that article was written, I don't remember, something like 1995 or 1996. And that was absolutely true. Now, a lot of other people got spun off on, you know, well, when will the peak be and all this other kind of nonsense that, you know, really was not part of the original idea. But the original concept of the end of cheap oil is absolutely true today. Absolutely. That never changed. So the answer then is that we are in a world where we have not figured out, nor do I think we will figure out, how to reduce our use of energy because energy, and I'm not just talking about oil and gas, I'm talking about all energy. If you don't have a bunch of energy to use, then your economy stagnates and declines. And nobody wants that. Everybody wants economic prosperity, and that usually means economic growth. And so we, we, have, a, we have a dilemma in that we, 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 
not only want it, we, we need economic growth. And yet we don't have the surplus energy that is a prerequisite for economic growth. And we've used up the debt card pretty much, uh, at least in my view. And, and, and so the next phase going forward, assuming that everything kind of goes back to normal in Russia, Ukraine, and et cetera, which I don't think it will, is we're still facing that, that problem. And that is that we simply do not know how to continue growing the economy with the energy supply available. And, and we talk a lot about alternative sources of energy and renewables and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm all for that. And that's all great. But I think the, 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 the inevitable problem is that all of those renewables, and I, I, when I say renewables, I mean, I, I really mean non-fossil. So nuclear, hydro, solar, wind, all of the above, most of that is really only good for electric power generation. Okay. And, and electric power is about 20% of the energy used. Now, you know, you can go someplace and probably find a number that double that. And that's because it's not accounting for the loss. There's a huge amount of energy loss in the generation, transmission, and distribution of electric power. You lose half of it. You actually lose 55%. So, so we're, sol- we're, we're all focused on solving the 20% of the problem and not paying attention to the 80% of the problem. And so if all of our green initiatives and you know net zero and all this, if it's all wildly successful, we've, we, we've really moved a lot of deck chairs around on the Titanic and the ship is still sinking. You know, we've, we've gotten rid of, we, you know, we use less coal, maybe we use less oil, we use less natural gas, we're using more solar, we're using more wind, for a 20% part of a 100% problem. And, and, and uh, we don't talk about that because it, it's unpleasant to talk about that. But that is the reality. And, and you know, don't, don't just listen to me. I mean, you can look at anybody's forecast. You know, the most energy, the most green friendly organization in the world is the IEA, the International Energy Agency. And their forecast for 2050 is that electric power is going to be about 28% of, of total energy consumption. Okay, that's better than 20, but it, you know, it certainly doesn't solve the problem. So I, I'm not trying to discourage people. I think we really need to move forward with all forms of energy. It's just we don't have a solution to the 80 or the 70%. And that's going to have profound implications for investment and for growth. And, and the longer that we are in denial, about two things. One is energy supply and our ability to somehow, you know, uh, find a silver bullet, whether it's technology or renewables, both of which are bogus. If we're in denial on that and we're in denial on climate change, then we're going to miss a ton of investment opportunities. Forget about the state of the world. Okay, let's be selfish. As long <laughs> as we spend all our energy denying the obvious, those two things, we're going to miss some awesome opportunity. So let's stop doing that. Let's open our eyes, look at the charts, look at reality and say, okay, I don't like what I see, but there's, there, there, there is, one of my old friends used to say here in Texas, you know, there, 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 there's a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, Art, look, um, you just gave a, a great walk through the next video I want to do with you. We talked about having it um, soon after we recorded last time, which really was this larger story about the looming energy cliff and uh, our current society's unpreparedness for it. We're sort of sleepwalking into this future of less and less net energy to be able to do things with. And, and I won't rehash all the great points that you just made. I do want to flag for folks watching that I will still bring you on to give that topic the justice it deserves. We're not just going to shoehorn it in here at the end of this one. Um, and I like that you had tried to end it on a, on, on a positive note, meaning like, hey, there's going to be, you know, if we just look through the, the investment lens, there's going to be some great opportunities here for investors. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, I, I want to try to end this on, 
at least some sort of positive note. Um, right. and, and really on that topic, um, uh, but very quickly, uh, if 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 you can sort of give your thoughts on, you know, we have investors watching this video. Most people watching here are watching because they they want to protect and grow their wealth going forward, and they realize it's an increasingly uncertain world. Um, it seems like you think things are going to get pretty rocky and challenging this year, at least in terms of energy prices, which are going to have all the knock-on effects that we talked about economically. So I, I guess in, in ending here, um, can you give your thoughts to any advice that you would have for the viewer here uh, to prepare for what you think is coming ahead You know, for the rest of this year, 2021? And then maybe, and, and I'm assuming that might be kind of preparing for for bad things mostly. Uh, but then if you can then sort of at the end add, you know, what are some of those longer term investment, positive investment or, or opportunistic investment opportunities that you're you're referring to there? Uh, and just give people some some things to start looking into um, as, as longer term invest, investments to take advantage of that that opportunity. Well, I mean, energy is is the, you know, the I mean, it's it, it's the, the it, it's the most neglected um, investment opportunity that that's out there in you know at least in the United States. I mean, the if if you look and uh, it's not in this particular post, but I put it in a previous one. If you look at the percent of energy, I mean, total energy. We're not just talking oil and gas. We're talking about all energy. I mean, energy performance, stock performance has been declining steadily since 2014. And ESG has been um, increasing steadily since about the same time. So, so the first thing I would say is, is that I, mean, I don't want to discourage anyone from investing in whatever they think is right. But uh, I, I think the bloom is, 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 is going to be off the ESG rose or whatever the proper cliche is. I mean, um, that's a, you know, it's just really hard to see compared to energy going forward, how that's very attractive. I mean, and, and so if anything that I'm saying, even, you know, 10% of it is true, uh, it's just going to be really hard to lose money in energy over the next couple of years. Again, as long as you do it with a little bit of intelligence, I, you know, don't just throw money at the energy business. There are you know, there are better companies and there are worse companies. And so I told you that at least in the United States, I mean, the Permian Basin is where where the reserves are. And so there's a handful of companies that have excellent positions in the Permian Basin. Those are the ones you want to invest in if you want to go into oil. All right. Natural gas. Um, there's a graph in there uh, in that post that shows UK natural gas prices. And then, you know, almost along the X axis is US gas prices. And they're a fraction. I mean, they're still really cheap. I mean, UK gas prices are, you know, in, in, in our terminology are like 60 bucks per, you know, MMBTU or, uh, you know, uh, MCF of gas and, 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 and US gas is like, you know, four dollars, four fifty. Okay, so one of the solutions that, or it's not a solution, but one of the remedies that places like Europe are looking at as they get cut off or want to be cut off from Russian gas supplies is importing more gas from the United States. I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? <laughs> um, we got lots of gas and it's cheap and they don't have enough. And if they cut off Russia, they got even less. So um, you know, U.S. natural gas, again, you know, be careful. Not all companies are equal, um, but, but, but some of them are, are, are really attractive. And LNG is tricky too, liquefied natural gas, but some of those are really good and some of those are really not. You know, look at the renewables. I mean, there's a lot of renewables that are fundamentally underwritten by the government. I mean, you know, you, you may not make a, you know, a, 50 or 60 percent IRRR, but you're not going to lose any money either. You know, look at um, at the kind of companies that bid on electric power contracts. I'm talking about the day forward electric power contracts. I mean, most of those contracts are bid at zero. Okay, 
The company needs nothing in return. And that's because for all the, the renewable energy credits that they get, and I'm not talking about a subsidy, I'm talking about companies like Facebook and Google that are buying these renewable energy credits so they can advertise themselves as green. There are a lot of, of electric power producers that are bidding zero on contracts because they can. I mean, you know, that's something to look into. Again, I'm not recommending anything. I'm not a financial advisor, but I mean, there we, we've taken, and, and I would have made all these recommendations two or three weeks ago, by the way. It's just with what's happened now with, with what's, you know, what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. I mean, you know, it's like times five. <laughs> so anything that was a good idea a month ago is a much better idea today in energy. And, and I don't, I, I'm not qualified to talk about anything outside of energy, so I won't. But, you know, if, if anybody wants more detail, I mean, you know, contact you, contact me through you. Um, I'm happy, you know, I do consulting work and I'll be happy to, you know, to, to give you detail um, on, 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 you know, how can you evaluate those companies? And I'm not trying to drum up work here, but if people are interested, that's what I do. But for the, you know, for the moment, I mean, you know, look at artberman.com. I put a ton of stuff out there for free. You know, look at this post that, that, you know, that Adam's been guiding himself by. I mean, if you don't get some ideas from that, um, I, I maybe, maybe, maybe I can't help you. I don't know. But um, as I said, there, I mean, the world runs on energy. Energy is the economy and the world has a problem with energy. So there is going to be, there are going to be, you know, all kinds of opportunities if you know how to, how to calibrate them correctly. Great art. Oh gosh. I know people really appreciated those specific ideas that you just had there and they, they just, make such compelling logic <laughs> you, you, you hear you explain why those are so um you know seem so practically obvious to you so um a couple questions are and and i'm going to warn you you're probably going to get a lot of people contacting you <laughs> having made that generous offer um I, I feel like these energy investments are not dissimilar from a lot of other sectors that we recommend people um, consider here, and I'm, I'm going to think about the, the gold, precious metals, mining stocks, where you know there's a lot of miners out there. They're not all created equal. In fact, a lot of them uh, are probably not going to end up doing very well. Um, and so, if you want to invest in that space beyond just owning the ETF and just capturing the general beta of the sector, um, we highly recommend that people follow the guidance of um, specialists, analysts that follow that space closely, that, you know, that, that's their job, right? And they're, they're, they're really trying to find the diamonds amidst all the other um, chafe what out there. I know I'm mixing my metaphors here. Um, I, are, are there, are there, Experts out there, it sounds like you know you obviously have a lot of expertise in the space. But are there you, know, you don't have to name any, but are there newsletters and other experts out there that folks can you know with a little bit of searching on the internet uh, find some good ones out there? Yeah, very much so. And um, you know some of them, you know, I I, I subscribe to some. Uh, there are there are many that are uh, you can you can get the essence of what they've got for free. So uh, again, uh, you know, just uh, that 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 that's free advice. And you know, I'm not going to promote anybody in a public way right now, but, um, you know, write to me, uh, uh, you know, you can write to business manager at artberman.com. That's my business manager and he'll forward those emails to me and I will you know, give you a list of, uh, of, uh, of reliable people that write in the space beyond, beyond what I, I mean, I rely on them and I, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs is, is very generous. I mean, they have all sorts of uh, interviews on Bloomberg. They have to subscribe to Bloomberg, maybe. But you know, guys like uh, Jeff Curry and Damian Kerbalin. I mean, they're they're on there all the time, and they're basically telling you, you know, the well, they're telling you part of of what I'm telling you. So there's, yeah, there, there's a lot of publicly available information that will make you a lot smarter in a hurry. And um, I'm glad to, to pass that along. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate that, Art. All right, look, I could keep talking to you 
with you on this topic literally for another like five hours, but I've got to wrap it up here. Sure. Um, I know you're very active on Twitter. I follow you daily on it. And, and folks, um, you know, if you, if you like, if you like your analysis backed up by uh, lots and lots of data and charts, you're going to love Art's Twitter feed. So Art, what, what is your Twitter handle for folks that would like to follow you there? At uh, A.E. Berman 12. And, and, you know, I'm a little salty, as you know, Adam. I mean, I, I, I don't just put information out there. I, I, I tell people, you know, this is why I think this is nonsense. Or, and, and some people don't like that. But um, my, my followers, they go up all the time because they're, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to win a popularity contest. Um, I'm trying to, to, uh, to, to meet a clientele that actually wants to know what I think. And can take a little bit of, of you know, uh, of the, the tongue in cheek or the, you know, the, the abrasive edge sometimes. When somebody says something stupid, I'm going to tell you, I think it's really stupid. Well, yeah, I, right. I, I would I would say I would describe it as calling it as you see it, which I think in this world of, of both information overload and, and a lot of sketchy information out there, I think a lot of people really appreciate. Um, well, Art, again, thanks so much for coming on, folks. Um, I highly recommend that you read Art's article. Art, if it's all right with you, what we'll do is we'll put that up at wealthion.com slash oil shock. And you can read the article there and then we'll put a big button at the end of it to Art's website. So you can go there and subscribe to read all of Art's additional information going forward. But that's free and all sorts of other stuff. I mean, you know, I think my website requires you give us an email address, but there's tons of free stuff that you don't have to subscribe to. Awesome. All right, Art. Well, look, um, I will have you back on again soon to really dive into that whole sort of long-term future of, of peak cheap oil. Uh, in the short term, um, we're going to be following your work, uh, both your published uh, emails, but also your daily Twitter feed to help me navigate um, what's uh, unfolding here in this very, very uncertain and fluid situation. I think you're going to have a lot of other people now doing that after this video. So thanks so much again for coming on. Art, everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thank you for having me. All the best.